Welcome to PowerGen International and Nuclear Power International 2011 here in Las Vegas. Hi, I'm Russell Ray, Managing Editor of Power Engineering Magazine. Over the next few days, more than 200 speakers will be taking part in 36 conference sessions and four mega sessions. The conference began with several well-attended pre-conference workshops on Sunday and Monday, and our annual golf tournament was held Monday at the Desert Pines Golf Club. We also had four technical tours. Two of those tours were at the one and only Hoover Dam. Another tour took attendees to the Walter M. Higgins Generating Station and the Good Springs Energy Recovery Station. And one more tour was held at the Harry Allen Generating Station, a high-tech gas-fired station north of Las Vegas. Our keynote session Tuesday morning will feature uh, compelling talks by high-ranking officials from Mitsubishi Power Systems, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Ecotality. You can follow all of this week's events on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and on the Power Engineering iPhone app. And they're putting the finishing touches to the exhibit floor here at the Las Vegas Convention Center. We have more than 1,100 exhibitors here and we're expecting a big crowd of more than 19,000 attendees. There will be a lot to see and experience here over the next few days and we hope you can make the most of your visit to this amazing conference and exhibition. Now to some of the headlines our news team is following this week. 
LS Power Group has dropped plans to build a 1,200 megawatt coal-fired power plant in southwest Georgia. The company canceled plans to build the $2 billion Longleaf Energy Station under a settlement with the Sierra Club. The agreement also requires the company to abandon a proposed coal plant in Arkansas. We have major news out of Durban, South Africa this weekend where the UN agreed to a new international mandate to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. After 13 days of intense negotiations, UN members agreed to a plan for developing a new international accord to control greenhouse gases. The new agreement will take effect no later than 2020. It would also extend the targets established by the 1997 Kyoto Protocol by five years. John Podesta, chairman of the Center for American Progress, said the new climate change deal means China will be compelled to make significant emission reductions. The Illinois State Senate has approved construction of a $3.5 billion coal gasification plant. Tenasca Energy received an air permit for the 730 megawatt Taylorville Energy Center from this state back in January 2009. The project was first proposed in 2007. The proposal will now move on to House lawmakers. The Illinois House is expected to vote on the project sometime in February. EDF awarded an $800 million contract to Areva to upgrade the monitoring and control systems at several nuclear plants in France. The improvements will be made to 20 reactors. The contract is part of EDF's industrial program for improving its nuclear installations. The first installment of new equipment will begin in 2015. Areva will be working in close coordination with Rolls-Royce to supply the technology. That's it for today's newscast. I gotta go. They're calling my name. We'll see ya. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Russell Ray, Managing Editor for Power Engineering Magazine and the PowerGen International Program Committee Chair. Good morning, good morning. It's glad to have you here. Welcome to PowerGen International and Nuclear Power International 2011. We have prepared a fantastic conference program for you over the next few days. It is a program designed to bring you the knowledge, the networking opportunities, and the tools that you need to adapt to a changing marketplace, to adapt to changing regulatory policies, and to adapt to changing technologies and performance. This is the culmination of a year's worth of planning. We have more than 200 speakers in 36 conference sessions and four mega sessions. And that doesn't even include the newest member to the PowerGen family, the Financial Forum. The Financial Forum features seven sessions and two seminars on the best financing strategies, the risks you need to avoid, and everything else you need to know to finance your energy project, big or small, in this tight financial market. So I would encourage anyone interested in financing to sign up for those sessions. Uh, we will be kicking things off in the financial forum first thing tomorrow morning with a roundtable discussion with a wide range of financial experts. I want to take a moment to uh, recognize a very special group of hardworking people. Uh, they are the ones who have pulled this together this week. They are volunteers and members of our conference planning committee. I want to take a moment to ask the members of our conference planning committee and members of our advisory panel for the financial forum to please stand to be recognized for all of your hard work. I must add that I am the newest member of this uh, committee, and I am so very grateful and honored to be a part of this uh, highly regarded group of experts, and I am looking forward to uh, working with uh, each and every one of you as we look ahead to uh, 2012. We have, a, we have a lot planned for you over the next few days. Uh, everything you need to know is in our conference show guide. Uh, you can find the conference grid that shows you exactly when and where the conference sessions are on page 34 of the show guide. Also, many of you have an iPhone, and we have developed a very handy tool uh, to uh, help you navigate your way around PowerGen this year. 
On the app for Power Engineering Magazine, there is an events button in the top right-hand corner. Uh, just push the events button and you can get a convenient list of all the conference sessions. You can get a list of all the exhibiting companies and best of all, you can get an interactive map of uh, the exhibit floor as well as videos and interviews from uh, throughout the week uh, here at Mount Power Gen. You can download that app uh, at no cost. It's all free. Also, we're very social here. Uh, social media is, is very important. We, we, you can also get updates and reminders about all of this week's events on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn as well. I want to remind everyone that we have 1,200 companies exhibiting at PowerGen this year and that our exhibit hall will be uh, open right after uh, this morning's keynote session. We have a lot of ground to cover in the next couple of hours. As you know, a lot has uh, changed uh, since we met in Orlando a year ago. The power generation sector continues to move forward and is making great progress, uh, but a series of events has led the industry to change its course. Uh, that is the theme of this year's keynote session. Major changes in pricing, policy, and financing are forcing power generators to rethink their strategies uh, for meeting demand and for meeting new stricter emission standards. For the first time ever, emission limits on mercury will be imposed next year. At the same time, stricter limits on nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide will take hold. Compliance will be costly, and some power providers say the price may include lost jobs, lost capacity, and a loss of reliability. The question is, will these plants be retrofitted with new technology, or will they be retired? In March of this year, the debate over the safety of nuclear power was reignited after the meltdowns at Fukushima. As a result, the prospects of adding new nuclear capacity have been put on hold as the world evaluates the events at Fukushima. New standards for nuclear safety are coming. The world is wondering what the new rules will look like and how they will affect construction and capital costs. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is here today to talk about the findings and the recommendations that could have a profound effect on new energy development in the U.S. But the disaster at Fukushima and the new limits on greenhouse gas emissions may not be the biggest factors behind the changing direction of this industry. Perhaps the biggest catalyst for change is the price of natural gas. Natural gas prices have plunged to historic lows amid a boom in domestic gas production. Coal to gas conversion projects are popping up throughout North America. Coal uh, people are wondering Will this be a lasting trend, and will it have a lasting effect on the course of new development in North America? This will be a major topic of discussion uh, during our plenary session Thursday at 9 o'clock. We have thus far uh, enjoyed unprecedented development of renewable energy in the U.S. Much of this development has been driven by federal incentives. Many of these incentives will be expiring next year and may not be renewed. What happens when the incentives expire? How will this change the course of new renewable energy development in the U.S.? And finally, the market for plug-in electric vehicles is growing. EVs are now available to consumers and the interest in uh, buying one is getting stronger. Uh, what kinds of investments, if any, will be required by utilities to accommodate the increasing use of EVs? We will hear today from a company that is building thousands of EVs uh, charging stations across uh, the U.S. Our keynote speakers today will uh, touch on all of these issues. Uh, let's meet our first keynote speaker. Uh, David Walsh is the Senior Vice President of Service and Manufacturing for Mitsubishi Power Systems America. Mr. Walsh is the Senior Executive Responsible for Management of Mitsubishi Generation Service and Manufacturing Business in the Western Hemisphere. He is responsible for field service, plant service, and parts manufacturing. He also leads the marketing efforts for services related to gas and steam turbines, generators, and related equipment. Uh, 
Before joining Mitsubishi, Mr. Walsh had several executive positions with Westinghouse in Pittsburgh, Chicago, and Orlando. At Westinghouse, he was the senior executive and vice chairman for five power generation manufacturing and service joint ventures in China. He was the general manager responsible for all international power generation service and repair subsidiaries. He served as general manager of the U.S. industrial service and renewable parts business, and he was the strategic development director of the power generation business. He is a man with a wealth of knowledge and experience. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Mr. David Walsh. Russell, thanks so much for the opportunity to kick off this great week. And from our industry, thank you for taking this role just four weeks ago and leading this great communication forum and great opportunity for us to be together again. Many of you know Russell just assumed these responsibilities just a few weeks ago. And our thanks to him as an industry for, for this forum. We gather once again this year. It's important to look back at, us, at our accomplishments as an industry, how we've helped our communities, our customers, and all of our stakeholders and to use this forum as a vehicle to ensure that one of our, the major challenges facing our industry is better met. And that is the challenge of getting the word out a little bit better externally on our history of innovation, job creation, supply, and supply, of course, of advanced generation technology. The challenges of delivering in our collective commitment to provide electricity that is reliable and affordable and scalable needs ever more heard clearly and better understood by many more people in many more walks of life outside of this room. As a group, we've kind of traditionally shunned the limelight. As engineers, we can be humble, and we tend to be humble. We tend to be content to let our accomplishments do the talking. Churchill might have said about us, never have so many done so much for so many so quietly. We're great at talking to each other. Let's leave here committed to externalize our great message. And that message goes far beyond monstrous technological achievement. We've collectively created jobs, made substantial investment, and sponsored huge innovation. We've improved the quality of life for millions, and we've done this protecting the environment, preserving natural resources, and making, of course, continuous progress on an ongoing basis in providing more and more efficient power. We need to be heard from in the National Energy Dialogue and be better understood. We have so much to look upon with pride, and we'll all benefit from the general public have a better, having a better understanding of what we really do and the challenges we actually face. As a point of departure on that, permit me to look at my, at my own company role in, in, in describing how we ought to project to, to ratepayers, to potential investors, and most importantly to young people who need to learn more about the challenges we face and the opportunities this industry brings to them. At Mitsubishi Power Systems, we've created over 2,000 jobs in the U.S. in the past 10 years. We've established our company's headquarters in Lake Mary and created our Orlando Service Center for service and manufacturing 10 years ago. We're celebrating 10 years of, of deep presence here this year. Just in Orlando, we've created 700 jobs in that time. Our new Savannah Machinery Works will create ultimately 500 jobs, initially centered on combustion component manufacturing, rotor and valve services, and as of this February, gas turbine manufacturing and assembly. This new facility will build the industry's largest and most fuel efficient large frame gas turbines, RG, and soon enough RJ technology units, and that manufacturing there will begin in just two months. We've also built a wind turbine to sell facility, manufacturing facility in Fort Smith. And in Houston, I think we've got a little out of sequence there, we've just announced our global fossil outage service center and uh, training and global training center. We're considering adding rotor services and major, major stationary part services there as well. The capital commitments in Houston should ultimately create hundreds of new jobs there as well. Our sister company, Mitsubishi Electric, has broken ground on a new shell-type power transformer plant in Memphis, a $200 million investment, which will employ 275 skilled workers. At Mitsubishi, we're proud that all of this investment has been person by person, brick by brick, 
as opposed through the, the retrading and churn of acquisition. We feel we've led all turbine OEMs in our 10-year investment record in the U.S. in quantity. And yes, our hat is off to our, US, our non-U.S. based competitors, who we should mention have also made significant investment commitments in this country to generation equipment manufacturing in places like Charlotte, also in Savannah, and in Chattanooga. This all reflects a renewal of commitment to major manufacturing investment in this country and, and the desire to create high-tech manufacturing jobs here. Begging the question, why the commitment to the U.S. market? Of course, it's a strong one. As long as the nation continues to welcome and encourage competition, offers an abundant skill base, broad supply base, has rational tax policies, along with competitive energy costs, our country will continue to see a desire to invest, build, create, and grow jobs. Our industry, our power generation industry, through the technology we create, plays a very key role in attracting manufacturing investment to this country. Take a look at this data. Draw your own conclusions. As long as we're focused on an industry, on keeping our generating customers in the advantage range from a cost of generation standpoint, there's going to be an attractive and buoyant market here for all of us to serve. We should be proud of this data. We've done a great deal to cause this in this world. We should work very hard to retain our position as, as one of the most competitive markets in the world for the consumption of electric energy. It's quite evident this industry is doing a great job of keeping these costs attractive so that most regions in the U.S. can entice new investment and the related employment that comes with it. Our work, obviously, has a direct and positive benefit for retail ratepayers as well. As a manufacturer of generating equipment, we at Mitsubishi and our competitors both see both sides of this economic equation. Of course, we, we enjoy manufacturing the most efficient, cost-effective generating equipment that we can, we can provide, but at the same time, we're a major consumer of, of electricity. Low electricity costs reduce the risk and, and raise the payback in the long run of manufacturing investment. So it, it goes to encourage more of it. Looking at the U.S., taking a look at that uh, rate uh, competitive picture globally, and that prior chart was looking at selected developed countries. Of course, not all of them. If we look now a little more deeper, do a deeper dive, look at our, these are our top five, or let's say top quartile, large utilities in terms of low rates. The most important metric, I would submit to you, the most important metric, competitive rates. So we take the the five very large top quartile performers among, among our utilities. And look at the, the picture on the left you see is a picture of diversification by fuel, by type of generation. A picture of diversification. Coal, natural gas, nuclear, hydro, small slice of renewables. Moving over to the other side of that, 10 years out, you see the changes occurring. The megatrends that you see, of course, are more gas, a lot more gas. A lot less coal, probably 10% uh, less coal moving in the aggregate. Again, this is the top five large U.S. electric utilities on the basis of retail rate and commercial rate performance. Coal declining, but still a big, big piece of the action. Nuclear growing across these five utilities, who I won't name, 7,000 megawatts of added nuclear will occur in the next 10 years, be put in commercial operation. Hydro, I think we show it growing. It's a, I think that might be a typo, actually, about the same. Renewables, on the other hand, about 2% growth. Some investment, some, uh, if you will, bets being made on certain technologies, but not a really significant game changer in terms of the, out, the overall perspective on where generation is coming from. But the point is, you see diversification, as any investor would, would play out managing their own portfolio risk being managed across a number of technologies and a number of fuels. And I would say further, to make the point about communication, if you look at this, making a different point. If you ask most young people in this country between 17 and 21 where the electricity behind the outlet comes, what are they going to tell you? It's wind and it's solar. Well, we need to educate a little bit better. This is the reality. This is where the power still comes from. We're talking gas, we're talking coal, we're talking nuclear. 
and we're talking renewables being an important piece of that picture, but not, still not a big one, and moving forward, and I haven't looked here, 20 years out could be a little bit different, but 10 years out, for many of us that could be a lifetime, hope not, but that's where we're going to be in 10 years, if you look at the major five cost-effective utilities in the country. As long as the market here remains free and open, ratepayers will force us, ratepayers at the end of the wires, to provide the most efficient and cost-effective solutions we can. Listen to what leaders in our industry who have decided to speak out are saying. Tom Fanning, chairman of Southern Company. Mike Morris, recently retired chairman of AEP. And remember these gentlemen are standing in the crosshairs of ratepayers who care mostly about reliable but cost-effective electricity being generated for them, cost-effectively supplied electricity. Their generation diversity message is very clear and simple. Keeps a priority on the cost of service, in contrast to a singular focus on renewables. The dialogue they drive for our industry is quite simple. Advocating existing ratepayers' interests and the interest of potential new investors and job creators for their service territories. That these job creators and investors cannot be left behind, their interests cannot be left, left behind in the national energy dialogue. Enticing job creation and creating an economic environment conducive to promoting growth balance very well with our shared concerns regarding the environment. We at Mitsubishi believe that diversity across technology and equipment supply options is a very good thing. Choices are good for business, good for customers, and translate to the benefit of ratepayers as well, of course, for the economy at large. If you look, for example, at the large capital equipment makers, generation equipment supply options that were available in this country even into the late 90s, the country had essentially only two, only two options. Now there are four. If you look at steam turbines, there are really five, big ones. If you look at nuclear, five big players involved. If you look at wind and solar, many, many, many more competitors than that, many more supply options. Transmission and distribution, many firms have come to the U.S. and invested, manufacturing firms that make that equipment, capacitors, relays, high-voltage gear, transformers. Numerous equipment suppliers have emerged. In short, equipment supply options and the competition they create are a very positive thing. We're proud to have been involved so deeply in improving that competitive landscape. In terms of technology advancement, more to be proud of. And it's not just Mitsubishi, but I'm going to focus on my company, of course. But we've all got a lot to be proud of here. Many of us remember, just 20 years ago, the largest commercially available gas turbines were nominally rated at about 100 megawatts. This past year in February, we at Mitsubishi celebrated the successful commercialization of a 320 megawatt, 1600 C firing temperature gas turbine at our factory in Takasago, Japan our Mitsubishi 501J gas turbine. This unit thus far, through nine months of demonstration, has demonstrated thermal efficiency in excess of 61%. 5992 BTU per kilowatt hour on a heat rate basis. This breakthrough is the result of nearly two decades of heavy research and development investment, leveraging off of our well-proven and reliable G engine program. We have 72 Gs running worldwide these machines are in the 250 to 272 megawatt range, whether they're GAC, G1, G1 Plus, or G. Twelve J machines have already been ordered by our customers in Asia, principally in Japan and Korea, following the release of this technology just this year. Mitsubishi continues to invest heavily in R&D with the long-term goal of, of, of putting out a 1700 C firing temperature machine in conjunction with the Japanese national program. Here's where this technology is tested and demonstrated at our Takasago Machinery Works, at our demonstration plant called T-Point. We began in 1997 a 500 million dollar investment program to build our own one-on-one -on -one combined cycle station at our factory owned by us, again 500 million dollar investment, to run the first G machine that we developed and built back in 97. Since that time, we've run G machines at the T point, at the T -point power station, 39,000 hours of operations, they, and they've seen about 2,200 and change in starts. Again, this February, we pulled the old G machine off of the pedestal. We've got the J running, first demonstration unit globally. 
has seen 2,643 operating hours and about 58 starts already. I'll tell you, over that 17 years, we've invested nearly half a billion in fuel and produced uh, megawatts on a heavily, heavily dispatched start and stop basis into the Kansai grid where we're not in control of the dispatch, the utility is. So we submit to you, the units run there at our demonstration facility see the kind of duty, the only kind of duty that really matters to demonstrate technology fairly for its preparedness for duty to then be put out in a customer site. And again, that's not experimenting at a customer site, but the experimentation, the verification occurs in our factory at the T-Point verification plant. Here's some uh, look at the future of how we see the generation market unfolding in the U.S. And the best example of that is the, the uh, Florida Power and Light West County Energy Center. Here over the past 18 months, we've commercialized a 3,600 megawatt combined cycle facility featuring nine Mitsubishi 501 G1 gas turbines. This is the largest combined cycle plant in the U.S. and among FPNL's fleet at this point, its most fuel efficient gas fired plant. Availability is running very high in the high 90 percentage range. The heat rate you can see and the combined cycle thermal efficiency about 58.3%. This size plant we see is the future of generation here as we move into scalable base load natural gas. Another example of that is Georgia Power's plant McDonough, 2,700 megawatts in commissioning now. A couple of the units will be up and running commercially by January. 2,700 megawatt plant. This plant will supply about 20% of the electricity in the uh, metro Atlanta area. West County, the uh, FPNL plant I had shown before, West County Energy Center supplies about 25% of South Florida's electric power needs. Another plant that we, we uh, took commercial eight years ago is the Mystic and then its sister plant, the Four River plants owned by Mystic Constellation Energy. Combined, there are 20, about 2,400 megawatts of combined cycle electricity. Again, producing about 25% of the base load generation need for the Boston metro area. So what do we see here? What do these super large machines do in terms of changing the games? They're a glimpse into the future of cost-effective gas fire generation in the U.S., particularly in the environment we're now in of fairly stable natural gas prices that the shale gas development seems to have yielded. But more importantly, these plants verify that base load generation with gas has been made scalable to become a reality in stacking natural gas plants at present price levels right behind nuclear as plants are dispatched by owners. We're proud of these sites because just a few years ago, many of us remember, remember plants of this size were only possible with either several nuclear reactors or perhaps three coal-fired boilers. Now natural gas is available to, to offer scalable, competitively efficient base load power and our J technology will take the promise of baseload gas a giant leap forward in efficiency and scale, as well as in operational flexibility with 50% load turned down potential while maintaining high part load cycle efficiency of 55% plus. This technology will play an even larger role if, as predicted by many, some 40 to 60 gigawatts of coal-fired capacity is shuttered over the next four or five years. As to spokesmen in the industry, Tom Cartwright, pioneers like Tom Cartwright, who created a great company in Calpine about 30 years ago, dedicated principally to the proposition of efficient, clean gas fire generation. His view on the long-term viability of gas now appears to have withstood the test of time, based now not only on an abundant supply of affordable gas, but also based on exceptional developments by us and a variety of manufacturers in the reliability and efficiency of gas-fired technology. As Yogi Berra might say, lately he's looking like a genius all over again. Since 1995, 95% of the new generation capacity added in this country has been gas-fired. Private capital operating in a free market of the unsubsidized variety has been primarily responsible for this plant build, as opposed to by folks reaching to the environmental regulatory momentum. Let's talk just briefly about emissions and, again, what we've accomplished and things we should all be proud of. And I'll talk a little more about Mitsubishi in that sense. This industry has provided enormous breakthroughs at huge development cost in the last 25 years. That new J-class gas turbine, for example, will deliver 3.2 times the power at 20 percent less NOx emissions per megawatt than the 100 megawatt predecessor machines of 20 years ago. 
and 23% less carbon emitted per megawatt. These machines will save ratepayers and operators 23% in equivalent gas cost per megawatt versus the technology we all provided two decades ago. If you look at a 480 megawatt reference combined cycle plant with J technology, the owner will save eight to nine million dollars a year in fuel cost compared now to the most to the best in class F technology available. These are incredible advances. Our industry has done precious little to promote these achievements among the nation's opinion makers or young people, many of whom do not know or appreciate what this industry has accomplished environmentally. We at Mitsubishi have spent several hundred million dollars refining this great G and J technology as well as advancements related to getting gas turbines way up the reliability curve and availability curve. For example, in terms of outage intervals, resembling what we used to be accustomed to 20 years ago from steam turbines, we're now seeing on large frame gas turbines in the infrequency that they need to be brought down for planned maintenance. There are other technologies that we've sponsored globally that deserve mentioning. We've got, um, in, in terms of uh, blast furnace and coke oven gas, the use of recycled blast furnace and coke oven gas, we've got 38 units installed globally. This put us in an outstanding position, this experience, heavy experience with low calorie gas in stepping that experience into the IGC arena. In 2007, in September of 2007, our first IGCC plant at Nakusa in Japan, 250 megawatt demonstration plant, went into service. It's been running now for four years, leveraging off of our heavy, heavy experience globally in low calorie gas, emanating from that blast furnace gas experience. We're also, maybe little known, not well known fact, we're the largest supplier of geothermal steam turbines in the world. We've got over 100 units supplying an excess of 3,000 megawatts of geothermal power globally. Our first carbon capture activity in the U.S., the Plant Berry Carbon Capture Demonstration Plant, is now in operation. 25 megawatts of the output of that plant have carbon run through our carbon sequestration and capture system, our first demonstration of carbon capture technology in, in the U.S. market, and we're proud of that. And finally, we've got the uh, two largest reactors that we provided in the present uh, renaissance going on in the U.S., um, 1,700 megawatt technology, our APWR technology provided to Dominion at their North Anna station by con contract and Luminant near Fort Worth in Texas. These plants will also feature, the steam turbine will feature 1,700 megawatt unit, 72 inch last row blade technology. Very, very, very large units. Footprint, smaller, capital cost, exceptional on a, on a per megawatt basis. We hope to see those plants in operation in the, uh, within the next eight to 10 years. In terms of getting the word out more effectively in our industry, recruiting is going to return as a major, major issue for the industry, and I would say probably go to the top of the heap. We need, in our case, millwrights, mechanics, welders, bladers, technicians and engineers, course with managers. We need people from a broad range of disciplines with many backgrounds. As an industry, we have a shared responsibility to get the word out about what we do, no matter what company we're with, big or small. We have a responsibility to invest in young people and encourage them to become a part of this great industry and our future workforce. And I'll tell you, and we're not different than our competitors, and we're proud of all what we all do. We pay top quartile wages. We underwrite most of the health care cost of our people. Our major competitors are no different. And this is a great industry in that sense doing great things. We need to get out of our comfort zone and speak more publicly about our leadership role among employers. And let's be candid about that. We know we're falling behind in this country, China and India, in terms of developing and educating and producing mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and nuclear engineers, of course, as importantly, tradespeople. We've got to commit collectively to reverse our historic identity crisis in this industry among a new generation of folks. We often compete with better known fields, IT, investment banking, biomedical engineering. A wide variety of areas have a lot more panache, a lot more public image than what we do, and what we do I'll submit very quietly. We're even identified by many young people as in that arena of dinosaur companies. We need to be visible at campuses. We need to be visible at job fairs. 
Here are some of our people speaking out. This is one of the great blessings of being able to invest in factories here. In each of the communities that we've joined, we've taken a very strident position at advocating for this industry by trying to get in front of young people as often as we can to talk about what we do. And by the way, this is an area of our life we're very happy to see our competitors do the same thing. Because anything we do together to talk about this industry and the value it brings for society and the job opportunities it brings and the career opportunities for families and for people, this is a great thing to do. We do too little of it. Here's our Scott Cloyd. He's our Director of Service Engineering, talking about technology in Mitsubishi. Lisa Batch Smith, a controls engineer in Scott's group, before a group of female students who want to look at careers in IT and technology. And those students were in late grade school and, and uh, junior high school. Georgi Georgiev, he's an accounting manager in our, in our Orlando facility, speaking to students about administrative and technical careers with Mitsubishi. Finally, in the upper left-hand corner, Michael Glover, who runs our active intern program with the University of Central Florida, and Bob Provotola, our general manager of our Orlando factories, talking to a large group of new interns from UCF. These are great things. They're very, very rewarding for our people to be involved in, but I would encourage that all of you in your companies get out and get the message out about this great industry. It's a great way to give back. Concluding, we need to speak out loud and often about what we do and what we've accomplished on behalf of the environment, the economy, and cost-effective energy production. We've got to describe to our young folks, behind that wall, behind that electrical outlet, there's a lot going on to provide the power efficiently that we know a lot about, but others know precious little about. Power those products that they love so much. This great forum, provides a great showcase for all of the big companies represented here and small companies to talk about what we do for the betterment of the economy and our standard of living. Really terrific communication against the backdrop of Occupy and big companies, suspicion and, and even concern by some that those of us in this industry are uh, seeking to damage the environment. Whatever those misimpressions are out there, forums like this and getting out of here and getting our message out more loudly and more openly help us all. So on behalf of my colleagues at MHI and Mitsubishi Power Systems Americas, thanks for your time, your attention, and your shared pride, and thank you for all you do. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that very eye-opening uh, presentation. We'll uh, hear much more from uh, David uh, during our uh, Q&A session uh, later on in the program. Our next uh, keynote speaker is uh, Donald Carner. Uh, Donald Carner is the president and CEO of Ecotality. Ecotality is a leading provider of electric transportation and storage technologies. The company serves as the project manager for the Department of Energy's EV project. Uh, under the uh, EV project, Ecotality is charged with overseeing the installation of about 14,000 commercial and residential EV charging stations in 18 major cities throughout the U.S. Mr. Carner has a very rich background in the energy business. Uh, he has more than 25 years experience in advanced transportation and 15 years experience in utility management. Mr. Carner also served as the Chief Nuclear Officer for Arizona Public Service Company during construction of the Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station. As President of Ecotality North America, Mr. Carner provides strategic direction, conducts research, and directs the development of products and services. He has written a number of technical papers on energy, the environment, and advanced transportation. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Mr. Donald Carner. Well, good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good, good. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss electric vehicles and the benefit they can provide the electric utility industry. I particularly appreciate uh, your attendance early this morning. I spent enough time in Vegas to know that the majority of you wish the alarm never went off this morning. So in return, I'll uh, attempt to keep this uh, very simple uh, for you. And my, my message is basically going to be to talk about why you should care if electric vehicles should succeed and what you should be doing to prepare for them.
So it's natural to ask, why should I care about EVs? And there are only a few thousand in North America. We've seen EVs try to penetrate the market in the late 1990s, and they failed. And the industry is already facing issues. Nissan has had supply problems with its electric leaf due to the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan. Ford has delayed the introduction of their all-electric focus. And just in the past couple weeks, General Motors has had to deal with fires in their Volt extended range EV after crash testing at uh, NHTSA. Now, it's true that these early market development issues are offset by a strong market pull for electric vehicles in the current market, rather than the regulatory push that we saw in the late 1990s. Automotive OEMs are announcing new launch cities for EVs on almost a daily basis. Oil prices continue to rise. And election rhetoric concerning energy independence is certainly inevitable. But the real answer to why you should care is far more simple than weighing the effect of market influences. The answer to the question of why should I care about electric vehicles is simply that EVs will improve utility capital resource utilization, providing more sales to carry capital and fixed O&M, benefiting both the utility and its customers. So let me try and explain. Electric vehicles represent an enormous new load. Every EV driven 10,000 miles per year represents an annual energy sales of two and a half megawatt hours. This compares to an annual energy sales of approximately six megawatt hours for an average home in California. That's a 40% increase in energy sales. By way of proof of this, the EV project, conducted by eCatality and the U.S. Department of Energy, has accumulated over 10 million miles in 2011, operating 4,000 Nissan Leafs and GM Volts. These miles were fueled by over two gigawatt hours of electric fuel. By the way, transportation energy sales of electricity are encouraged by most regulators as they're displacing petroleum fuels.